So today's video is going to be a little bit more kind of sciencey here, and we're going to talk about metabolic stress. And there's kind of three proposed mechanisms of hypertrophy. If you're watching this, you're probably you've probably at least heard of these before. So mechanical tension, metabolic stress, and muscle damage. So today we're going to focus on that middle one, metabolic stress. Now, <clears throat> metabolic stress is kind of the that pump and burn feeling that you get with training. It's that accumulation of metabolites. And metabolites are kind of metabolic byproducts of creating ATP, the energy that our, our muscles use for muscle contraction. So when we generate this ATP and we use this ATP, there are certain kind of byproducts or certain compounds that are resulted from generating this ATP. And this is things like hydrogen, phosphate, lactate, stuff like that. And this accumulation of these metabolites, metabolic byproducts, result in kind of fatigue, that, that kind of pump and burn sensation. And this is kind of proposed to be a mechanism of muscle growth. Now, why is this? Well, in, in Dr. Schoenfeld's book, I think it's called like the science and development of muscle hypertrophy, I believe. I'm sure if you just Google Schoenfeld hypertrophy book or something like that, it'll pop up. But in his book, he kind of goes over five different mechanisms of metabolic stress or why metabolic stress might result in hypertrophy. And I feel like these aren't talked about a whole lot. I think that the, the main one that most people hear of is cellular swelling. So that is a mechanism. So let's go over all five of them. So one of them is cellular swelling. So this is like the increase in intramuscular hydration in the muscle cell. And this swelling is thought to kind of result in a cascade of kind of anabolic signaling. It can influence like mTOR and AMPK, which can signal muscle protein synthesis and that sort of thing. And it can lead to hypertrophy. And essentially, what the theory behind what potentially happens here is that the, the muscle swells and it pushes up against some, some structures surrounding the muscle cell and that sort of thing. And our body perceives that as a threat. So that threat response signals a cascade of events that leads to, okay, we need to reinforce this area, grow some muscle, that sort of thing. So that's one of them. Another one, an increase in the accumulation of reactive oxygen species. So when I first heard this term, I was like, oh boy, what the heck are we talking about here? And it took me a few ex-phys classes to kind of really get a good idea of what this is. So what is this? Well, it's actually all in the name here. So reactive oxygen and species. So these are forms of oxygen, species of oxygen that are kind of highly reactive. Reactive. So reactive oxygen species. These are highly reactive kind of forms of oxygen. And this is kind of what is thought to be as like kind of like oxidative stress and stuff like that. And when our body has a little bit of this oxidative stress, a little bit, we don't want too much. And we also don't want none at all. If we have a little bit, it can result in a signaling cascade that leads to adaptation. Similar to kind of cellular swelling, we have this threat, so we need to adapt. Well, if we have a little bit of this stress here, we need to have adaptation. It's kind of the reverse how antioxidants, too much of them to where you have no oxidative stress at all can kind of blunt the adaptations or the hypertrophic response. So an increase in reactive oxygen species is one kind of mechanism behind metabolic stress. Another mechanism, number three, is an increase in fiber recruitment. And this isn't necessarily specific to metabolic stress type training because we can get this with just lifting heavier weights. But when we have this accumulation of metabolites, we start recruiting more and more kind of higher threshold motor units. So basically the way that our body works is that, or at least the way we think it works, is that 
we start recruiting motor units from small to large. So we'll start out a, a, a set if we're plenty far from failure and say we're doing a set of 15, we would start recruiting kind of slower twitch fibers and smaller motor units and stuff like that first. And then as we get more fatigued and fatigued, we'll recruit faster and faster twitch fibers and those higher threshold motor units. And when we have this metabolic stress or this accumulation of these metabolites, we will start recruiting these higher threshold motor units. So this is some of the rationale behind with low loads. As long as you train closer to failure, you accumulate some of these metabolites, you can still recruit all of your muscle fibers and see pretty good growth. So that's kind of the third mechanism there. And number four is a modulation of myokines. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Probably not. But my understanding of what these are are basically substances that are produced by the muscle cell that can influence different systemic processes and different signaling and stuff like that. So the, the muscle cell itself will produce these different myokines, and I believe that these are certain types of proteins and stuff like that that can have various effects in the body that can lead to muscle growth. All right, so that's kind of the big picture overview. So that's number four. And the fifth thing for why metabolic stress may lead to muscle growth is an increase in acute anabolic hormones. So particularly, we see an increase in growth hormone and IGF-1. And while acute hormone responses don't generally necessarily correlate that great with increases in muscle size, like it was once thought that, hey, you should do the, the type of lifting that increases your testosterone the most because it will result in more muscle. These acute changes actually seem to have somewhat trivial effects. But this one is still kind of worth mentioning because these, these differences in growth hormone and IGF-1 are between like 90 and 250 fold, which is a substantial increase there. Now, whether these acute effects really have much of an influence on hypertrophy, it's hard to say. But considering they are such substantial increases, there could be something there. So, the five mechanisms of why metabolic stress may be an independent driver of hypertrophy you get those increases in acute anabolic hormones. You have the myokine production. You have that increased fiber recruitment of those higher threshold motor units. You get the increases in cellular swelling, and then you get a greater accumulation of reactive oxygen species. And whether metabolic stress is how large of a driver of hypertrophy it is, it's, it's hard to say, but I do think that there's something to it. And I think that it's, it makes the most sense to hedge your bets and do some work to make sure you're at least getting a pump every once in a while. And some programming considerations are if you're going to be doing like a bunch of metabolite techniques like drop sets, supersets, stuff like that, I would say towards the end of your training sessions, towards the ends of your training weeks, probably makes sense so you can better manage that fatigue. Also, Maybe not doing a ton of metabolite work for the same muscle, meso after meso after meso is probably a decent idea because our body's pretty good at kind of figuring out how to clear these metabolites and to adapt to that specific style of training. So we might see far diminishing returns doing it meso after meso after meso. So maybe after a couple meso cycles of a single muscle group, you switch it up. So maybe you do biceps and triceps for a meso cycle or two okay, now let's do chest and back or something like that, switching it up, all right? So I think it makes sense to kind of hedge your bets there. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Q&A next week, let me know if you have any questions and I will see you next Sunday.